like I said, it's good to be back at Harvester, and it's, it was good to get back in a groove this week because uh, I've been away at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, actually Decatur, Georgia, right next to Atlanta, and uh, the first week I had a class that just really I thought was great, and the second week was two classes that just taxed my brain and were pretty intense and I couldn't wait for the last one to get over so we could get out of there. Um, it was good though. Um, I need that. And I had the pleasure of getting to listen during my two weeks up there to eight different sermons that were given, six of them by classmates. And what a time. They, they, they intentionally tried to build us up and make us feel needed and important while we're there and just to, to give us some um, opportunity to, to not only hear the word but to get to sing and join together as pastors and, and uh, sing. To, uh, the music was awesome and um, the sermons were great and I, I really, really enjoyed them. Our class on week one was evangelism. And our teacher in the pre-work videos was rather monotonous. <laughs> and as he would read to us on the screen and we were taking notes, it felt like I was going to fall asleep any second. And every once in a while my pen would go off and I did fall asleep. But that's how we talked. And, I, and we, you know, as Rick and my friend Rick Phillips from uh, Grace United in Plant City rode up together. And as we were on the way up, we were talking if he talks like that in class, how hard it might be to stay awake. We didn't have that problem at all. He was not like the videos. He was absolutely... Wonderful, and I have now taken 17 of the 20 required classes. Thank you. Thank you. God willing, I'll be done next summer. Um, but of the 17 classes, this by far, this evangelism class was the most exciting and helpful class I've had since I've been there. And I'm telling you, my classmates would come up and they'd say, how, how, what do you think of this class? I'd say, well, I think it's wonderful. And they go, oh, we do too. We just think this is the best class. We did so much uh, stuff together that it was really, really uh, a great time. Um, I'm going to share a couple of stories as the sermon goes along, but as I said in the wild this week, we, we've been asking you to invite your neighbors and your friends and family to come to church, but we really haven't taken much time to share how you do that and how you can get comfortable. And if, if you remember anything about last year when I came back from class, you had to go through two Sundays of slides about John Wesley right, right. and the Methodist Church and how it got started. None of that today. This will be a lot more practical, a lot more enjoyable, I think. Um, but I, I, hope, I hope you get something out of it. The meaning of the word evangelize means good message, good story, good news, good tale, God's tale, gospel. The good news isn't about movie night or the Easter egg hunt or BBS. It's about sharing the word of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, with those who don't know Him. So what does it mean to evangelize? In basic words, it's how we share the gospel. To evangelize is not what we do to people. It's what we do with the gospel. It's not what we do to people. I don't evangelize to people. I share the good news of Jesus with people. Evangelizing is spreading the good news by word, deed, and sign through the power of the Holy Spirit and then waiting and watching in respectful humility and working in expectant hope. The results of a survey at the 8th 
International Evangelism Seminar showed the top seven methods used to evangelize as the following. The first way is visitation. The next is building real friendships, getting to know people. Not just looking at my neighbor, but actually getting in conversations and getting to know them. It's in one-on-one -on -one conversations. It happens in home meetings and small groups. It happens in Alpha Course, and Alpha is a series of interactive sessions that freely explore the basics of Christian faith. It's kind of a, a Bible study type class. Personal testimonies. And the, the number seven thing was outreach, helping the needy. John Wesley, and if you don't know who John Wesley is that I just mentioned, he is the founder of the United Methodist Church. And his greatest fear was this. I do not fear the people called Methodist shall ever cease to exist either in Europe or America. I only fear they shall exist as a dead sect, having the form of religion, but not the power thereof. And that undoubtedly will be the case unless they hold fast to the doctrine, discipline, and spirit with, with which they first set out. And Wesley said that in 1786. In other words, if Methodists only pretend to be a group and don't do what Wesley felt was necessary to remain a faith-sharing group, they are not doing what his plan for us was. Wesley followers have said this, people called Methodist must be a faith-sharing congregation. Amen. I'm going to say that again. People called Methodist must be faith-sharing congregations. Mm. We need to get out and tell our story. What brought us to Christ? How did we get to know Jesus? And we need to listen to the stories of those we're out talking to. And Methodists are to be a contagious community and an inviting people. As I said earlier, I, I, think, I think we do a great job of inviting people to things. But do we... Just bring them to watch a movie or come to an egg hunt or the pumpkin patch or do we actually get in a conversation with them about Jesus? <clears throat> well, day one of class, we all went through and we told who we were and you know, how important we are to our churches and, and <laughs> what church we go to and what our job is there. And that takes about an hour usually. There were 16 in our class, and we got to kind of know. And some of these I've been in class with uh, last year, and, and I look forward to being in class again with next year. And it's a great time of just kind of refreshing our memories about who does what where. Some of them, some of them had moved to churches. One or two of them had preached their first, sun, their first Sunday in their new church and then drove to school that afternoon. And they would, weren't going to see their church again till uh, two, two Sundays later. That's one of the advantages of being an associate, because you can, you know, bet your senior pastor to preach that week when you're, you're leaving. But this this time we left together, <laughs> and we had a guest that week, so it worked out. But here was our first thing: we had to pair up with someone in our class, and as we sat there. The thing that he wanted us to do, we, we, we were a group of Americans that had just landed on Russian soil. And we're getting ready to go on a mission trip in Russia. And once we got paired up, this, this is how we explained it. We're standing at the train station ready to go from where we got to where the mission was going to be. And while we were there, a Russian lady walks up to us and says... Tell me about Jesus. And he, and, and he said, as, we, as we're standing there and that person's asking that question, we look up and the light on the trap turns green. 
And when that happens, that means the train will be there in one minute. And when it turns red, you need to be on the train and go or you're going to miss your train to wherever you're going. You have one minute to share Jesus with a person on the platform that you've never met before. And he said, go. And one of us on one side of the table gave one minute's worth of what Jesus meant to us. And how we got to know Jesus. Whatever we could think of. Because, I mean, we were not... We were not prompted before class to, to be prepared. We just did it. And then he said, okay, time, switch. And the other person had to give their minute testimony. Think about where you're at at times. And you got one minute to share Jesus with someone. How do you do that? What do you say? <coughs> And once we kind of threw out ideas to him as to what we had said, he started giving us more ideas and throwing out more ideas and saying, hey, I want you to listen. What about this? What if you would have said this? What if you would have done this? And we're all like, oh my gosh, that's great. i got to try and absorb that in my sponge and keep it in there. But it doesn't always. It's not always that easy. We have to... We have to go at every conversation with a purpose. We are United Methodists, and our job is to share our faith. We've heard that this morning, and that's what Wesley was concerned about, that we would quit doing that. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we need to pray. And I've been doing this... A lot different. My prayers start out a lot differently than they have been, and I'm asking God if there's a person that you put in front of me today, Amen. may I be the words that you want said as I talk to that person. Because those are the conversations, those 30 to seconds to 60 seconds that we may have to share Jesus with someone. And how do I do that? Now, you, you may be thinking, well, I'm not going to talk to every person about Jesus. No, you're not. But if you pray in the morning, and some of you pray specifically for people in your family or neighbors or friends that you want to know Jesus. And one of the things I read this week is, is, is that if you continue to pray a name, that name will be standing in front of you before you know it. And you're going to have that opportunity to then speak and say what you need to say to them. So, we need to pray and we need to ask that the Holy Spirit would guide us to that person. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. We must be grounded in prayer. When we talk with God about a person, we soon find ourselves talking with that person about God. And the other key thing that they wanted us to remember is that listening opens doors. Sometimes just hearing someone's story opens doors for us. And it allows us to maybe say, you know, I had a similar situation. I, I can't necessarily say that I've been in your shoes before, but this happened to me once. And this is how I handled it. Um, sir with the flamingo shirt, would you come up here for a second? <laughs> Thank you. Now, I know you may not believe this, but we, I've never met. Have I seen you before? No. Okay. Nice to meet you. I'm Pastor Gary. Good to have you up here. I like your shirt. So, um, you like flamingos or did someone punish you? And, well, this, well, do you prove that? No, 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 I like them. You like flamingos? Okay, very good. My granddaughter loves them too, and I know that they're, I know that she's been in your office and tried to steal things in the past. So, all right, and, and I'm keeping my eye on her. I promise you, sir. Uh, but anyway, isn't it interesting that uh, the flamingo is so different than a lot of birds? Like, it, it looks different, but you know, every once in a while you'll see one standing around like this, and you know, don't you think that? God spent a little more time on flamingos than maybe some other animals? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I want to tell you that not only flamingos, but 
even though I, you know, we've been told that we look alike occasionally. Please look. <laughs> People have said I always get them mixed up because they look so much alike. Anyway, but God made us different. He made us different for a purpose. And each one of us is different. And if you want to hear about how Jesus changed my life sometime, please please give me an opportunity and I'd be glad to tell you that story. Are you willing to do that someday? Yep, let's do it now. All right. That you have a nice day. Okay. <laughs> you gotta share. That's the part where I gotta listen uh, a little better. So that's how easy it, it's a shirt that you can start in a line. I can't tell you how many times at Publix when I was working there, I would see someone's facial expression and I would ask them, well, "How are you today?" And I would turn to scan the groceries and turn back around and I had one lady just sobbing and she said I found out my husband's going to leave me today well how do you deal with that when you're working you know it's, it's a little hard at times but if someone if one of my leads would come by and I could put them in my spot to finish the job I would walk that person to their car I I was standing in the, if you know how it is at Publix, if you're in the um, express lanes, there are no baggers usually unless they're standing there flirting um, with the girl that's the cashier or the guy or whatever it is. And uh, they're not supposed to be, but it happens on occasion. But one day I walked over to ask someone something, and I could tell this girl was very upset. She had on really dark sunglasses, and so. I was free, and I just asked her, hey, can I walk you out to your car? There's something bothering you today. And, and she started sobbing and said that just the day before, they had been at a family reunion, and she was with her grandma, who she loved dearly. And overnight, her grandma passed away. And she goes, I was just so glad I had that opportunity. Yeah, and I didn't force Jesus on her, but I did ask her if I could pray for her, and she said, please, Amen. and I did. Right. Sometimes it's just that little prayer sure. time that you can offer someone. Yes. You know, I, I walked so many people, I would look at bumper stickers, and if there was one with the cross or a church, I'd, well, tell me about your church. I would get in a conversation about that. You know, sometimes a husband might have that on his bumper sticker and not be the one that goes to church. <laughs> and sometimes those are good conversations to have. Right. So we have to be aware of what's going on. Our assignment, Monday, we got a, an assignment the very first day. And the assignment was that we were to pray that the Holy Spirit would lead us to someone that week anywhere in the community that wanted us, that the Spirit wanted us to talk to them about Jesus. Even as pastors, that was intimidating to hear that. And we're like, oh my gosh, how's that going to happen? Where are we going to be? How, you know, I'm riding with Rick. He has a car. I don't know where I'm going to... You know, all these, all these excuses start filling my brain immediately. And he tells us, just go out, and I can't wait to hear your stories on Friday when you come back. We're going to share our stories. <clears throat> I had gotten a new cell phone right before I went to class on Tuesday, and I left on Sunday. And my phone wasn't, um, it wasn't receiving mail. So I told Rick, can we go to a Verizon store? So this was Tuesday evening. Oh, by the way, on Monday evening, we went to dinner and we blew a chance. We both felt bad. I, I woke up during the night thinking about the opportunity we had to talk to a, a man outside of a restaurant who actually was begging for money. And I did give him money, but I didn't take the opportunity to talk to him. And the, and the reason I didn't was because in class, we were told, try and come up with a transition statement that you can talk about. So I, as I talked to Russ about his shirt, I talked about flamingos. That was my transition into, isn't it cool how God made them so different than any other? 
because they may say, I don't know about God making animals, or you know, they could have come, they could come back with any kind of answer. But in this case, um, I had on one of my North Carolina shirts, and he goes, Hey, North Carolina, you probably got money. <clears throat> That's how he started. <laughs> And I, I said, I said, well, I might or I might not, you know. And he said, well, he goes, I, I, I stay in a place that costs fifteen dollars a night to go and stay, and I don't have enough money to get there tonight. And so, in my brain, I'm thinking, how do I make this into a transition sentence and not a question? And because I couldn't come up with it, I ended up not having a conversation. I woke up four times Monday night thinking, how do I get, how, I always ask the question, how are you today? Are you feeling okay? Whatever. And he said that asking a question sometimes will shut them off because they don't want to answer what you've asked them. But if you trans, transition over in a sentence and just start talking about how nice the flamingo shirt works, or how, ne how nice your next door neighbor's yard looks, then those conversations, they're, they're not something that's going to make them withdraw and not want to talk to you. So I woke up four times and I kept in my head thinking, what sentence could I have used? You know, and then I thought, look, Gary, you had an opportunity to talk to a guy about Jesus. Does it matter if you asked a question or said it in a sentence? No, it didn't. And I didn't take the opportunity. What Rick and I both thought about. He said he woke up once too and he thought about that guy again. And I said, oh, we were both feeling like we missed an opportunity. I went to class on Tuesday morning and I confessed. Class, I want you to know I blew a chance last night because I wanted him to tell me how I could have made it into a sentence. And you know what he told me? It didn't matter that you didn't turn it into a sentence. You should have just talked to him about Jesus. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so I'm at Verizon Tuesday evening and I go in and it takes three whole minutes for the lady to fix my problem and I'm out the door and right next door is Great Clips and I so wanted a haircut on Friday or Saturday before I went to class on Sunday and I didn't get it done. And I said to Rick, hey, I got done in three minutes. This takes five minutes. You got five minutes? He goes, I got to look at a tire. It looks like I might have a low tire on the car, so go ahead. So I walked into Great Clips, and and there um, I was number number. There was one person in the chair, so I was number two in the waiting list. And there was only one person cutting hair, and I thought, okay, well I'm sitting here number three now. If I count the person in the chair, but then the lady yelled to the back, Jen, and out came Jen. And Jen goes, Gary, are you ready? And I said, well, she was here first. She goes, well, she wants, she wants to use that lady over there, so come on over in my chair. She goes, welcome to the best great clips in the United States. <laughs> and I said, well, thank you. And she said, um, she said, what brings you here? And I said, well, I live in Florida, and I heard that this was the best great clips <laughs> in the United States, so here I am. <laughs> Can I get my hair cut here? And she said, you sure can. And she said, what are you really here for? <laughs> and I said, well, I'm in town taking a class at Emory. And she goes, well, what's, what's your job? And I said, I'm a pastor. And she proceeded to tell me three stories about her mommy. She called her mommy. This lady was not much younger than I am. But mommy and, uh, and her aunt. And uh, so it was interesting little stories. And as she's talking, she tells me, I quit, I quit going to organized church because my mom got sick. And as dedicated as she was to the church, when she went to the hospital, I called the pastor and said, would you please stop by and see my mom? And he said, I'm too busy today. And she said, I said some words I probably shouldn't have said. And then I never went back to church. And I knew the Holy Spirit had put the lady in front of me I needed to talk to. This was not Rick and I's plan for the evening, but I'll explain that in a minute. So I, I said, um, well, well, tell me what, you know, how did this transpire? And she told me a little bit about the conversation. And she said, I, I, uh, 
I, I told him, I see you every day at the grocery store just standing there talking to the people that work there. You do that every day, but you don't have time to go see someone from your church. And she was really upset with him. And because of that, she never went back. So I said, as I got my haircut done, and I said, Jen, is it okay if I pray for you? And she said, please, I'll take all the prayers I can get. She goes, I'm a very spiritual person. I said, well, do you believe in God? She says, yes, I believe in God. And I said, well, do you, have you uh, ever accepted Christ as your Savior? And she says, I, I did all of that when I was young, but because of this, I, I just don't go back. I stay spiritual, and I still talk to God once in a while, but I said, I'm going to pray that you find a church. She says, well, what faith are you? And I said, I'm a Methodist. She goes, I've never been in a Methodist church. And I said, we have the friendliest people. <laughs> <laughs> and if I brought her here, I would mean it 100%. Right. And I said, we have great people in the Methodist church. Maybe you should give the Methodist church an opportunity to make you feel wanted again as a church. And she said, you know what? I might try that. And I said, I'm going to pray for two things. I'm going to pray that you find a church. And I'm, I'm going to pray that you find a Methodist church to go try. And the second thing I'm going to do is, if you don't find a church, I'm going to pray that you get a women's group or somebody invites you at one point in your life and says, will you come join our women's group and that you say yes to them and go be a part of that. I, I paid Jen. I went to my car. I put my hand on my buddy's shoulder and I said, my homework's done. <laughs> he goes, I'm going to you. We, our plan that night was to go to Chick-fil-A and we were going to eat. And then we were going to buy, each buy a sandwich extra. And we were going to go to a park and sit and see if someone didn't need a sandwich eventually. And we were going to talk to them. But the Holy Spirit led me to Jen. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. My, my teacher pastor that was teaching evangelism that week preaches three exits north of where I got my hair cut that night. And I said, will you invite her to your church? And he said, well... He says, we're very multicultural, and I'm not sure that's the place for her to come back to. But I have friends that have Methodist churches right there in her area. And I, he goes, I will drive to the shop. She's the manager of the shop. And I will, invite, I will ask her to, to try one of these other churches, and I will ask that pastor to come talk to Jen, too. I don't know what's happened since then. But there's a, there's a possibility that this morning, Jen is sitting in a Methodist church because of a conversation that the Spirit led me to. Now, see how simple that was? I didn't, there's no theological brain work going on there. It's just a conversation. And boy, Jen, that's really bad that happened to you, but I hope you give it a chance again. So we, we leave, we go, we eat our dinner, and we only had about one extra sandwich at that point in time. And Rick, Rick buys his sandwich, and we start walking down the streets of Decatur, Georgia. We run into a guy cleaning the streets, and he didn't really want to talk, so we let him go. And we had looked down this alley, and Rick goes, look, Gary, there's a homeless guy back there. But he goes, I'm not comfortable walking down that alley right now. And, and I didn't blame him. There were steps there, and it, you couldn't see if anyone else was there. For safety's sake, we didn't go back there at the time. But about five minutes later, Ray goes, Gary, here comes that guy. And it's the guy that was in the alley is now walking up the street. He's wearing an, a U.S. Navy hat. And Rick was a Coast Guard member for years. And he said to the, the gentleman, he said, hey, I like your hat. Thank you for serving. And the gentleman said, you know, I've had this hat for about two months now. I found it in a uh, pawn shop. And I got it real cheap. But I did serve in the Navy, and that's why I bought it. And Rick said, well, I was in the Coast Guard, and the conversation started right then and there. One hat, ladies and gentlemen. Got it going. And he goes, I've had this hat for two months. 
And I've had people tell me they like my hat, but never once has anyone said to me, thank you for serving. And I appreciate the fact that you just did that. And Ray goes, hey, I know what it means. I know exactly what it means. And he goes, people gave me money for wearing this hat. He goes, I got 25 bucks last week just because they talked to me about my hat. And I go, well, I'm going to be one of those crazy people and I want to give you some money too. And I gave him some money that night. I came home empty, trust me. <laughs> and, and I don't care. God has it and God's doing with it what he needed to. But this man allowed Rick then to talk to him. He opened up. He shared that he was in a homeless shelter. And a man came in and said to him, Homer, would you like to live in an apartment? And he says, I don't have a penny to my name. Homer's waiting to turn 62, which he's got to be getting close, I'm guessing, so he can get his Social Security, but he has no other income. And at that point in time, the man said to him, I don't care, I've got a place for you. And, and there's a HUD building that actually had some apartments, and if they felt comfortable with someone living there, they could invite them, and Homer now lives in an apartment for free. All he has to do is find his meals, I guess, and I'm not sure he eats meals, but we're pretty sure he drinks a lot of them from our conversation. But that's okay. I mean, they had a great conversation, and then Rick says, can we pray for you? And we took time to lay our hands and pray for him, and he thanked us for that. And I have one last story. On Thursday, Jennifer, one of my classmates, gave the sermon. Being a, a, a good Christian person that, that I am, I thought, I wonder why she gets to preach again this year. She preached last year. <laughs> and it didn't matter. She, she went through her sermon, but she, she talked about our class, the evangelism class, because she was in that class with me. And... She told, she told our congregation, our, our group of pastors, about the, the last assignment that we had. And on the last day, the pastor, Pastor Worrell, just, he just stood up front and he goes, i got to tell you a story about a church that I visited once. And he goes, what they would do is once a month they would put names in a, in a plate and turn them in and then they would have them sitting separate when you left the church. And on those name cards were people that our congregation would write down that someone needs to go talk to them about Jesus. And they would put these names and then when you got your group that was going to go out that afternoon and talk to people, you just drew a name. And no matter what, you were not to put that name back. You were to take it and go. It had an address on it. And someone that someone had been praying for his name was on. And he picked Jennifer out of the crowd and just said, Jennifer, it's you and I today. And I just drew a name and he goes, but I think for the first time I'm going to put this name back because the name we drew is your mom's. And he said that Jennifer said to him, no, my mom needs to be talking about Jesus. It might as well be us. And so he, he's just giving this as a scenario and as Jennifer's preaching the sermon on Friday, she said, how did he know that I needed to talk to my mom? And she goes, we had one minute again and we turned around and we're all talking to our moms like she didn't know Jesus and telling them, and this is on you know, Thursday morning, so we're at a point where you know, we don't have much class time left. We better have our story down by now and we better be talking to mom or whoever it is we're supposed to be talking to. And Jennifer says, I started telling Sue that my mom just doesn't, she, she got so upset because I left the nursing field to become a pastor and my mom doesn't understand why I would leave that good job to go out and be a pastor. And she's, she knows who God is, but she's never accepted Him into her heart. 
And she says, time. And the instructor yelled, time. She didn't get to finish. And it was the other person's turn. And Jennifer goes on in her sermon to say, I know that when this week's over, I'm going to go home and have a conversation with my mom. You see what these little conversations do? And how did Pastor Worrell know that Jennifer was the one that needed to be the example of that story he was telling this morning? He had no idea, but the Holy Spirit had him use her name. And I saw her Friday morning and I said, Jennifer, was, was your story in the sermon real? She goes, it's as real as can be, Gary. My mom knows who God is, but she doesn't have them in her, in her heart. And it's a conversation we're going to have now. And I asked, I said, can I have permission to tell your story? She said, please do. Tell as many times as you want. So if you want to come to second, you'll hear it again. <laughs> but, but hear this. In that one week's class, 16 conversations with people in that community took place that would have never taken place had we not had class. He gave us an assignment that we thought might be challenging and every one of us couldn't wait to tell our story on Friday morning. Why shouldn't we be doing that too? My question for you. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we come this morning and we just ask now that the Spirit would put in our heart the importance of us being faith-sharing Methodists. That we wouldn't just hear the pastor's sermon this morning and, oh, those are great stories and be done with it. We have our own stories. Each and every one of us has a story. But you know what? So do those people that we get placed with. And we need to take time to listen and hear them as they tell their story to us. And then God use us to tell them why Jesus is so important in our lives. Father, use us. Challenge us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.